You're listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby, Director of Torch, the Torah Outreach Resource Center of Houston. This is the Jewish Inspiration Podcast. All right, my dear friends, welcome back. Welcome back to the Jewish Inspiration Podcast. I wanted to share with you a personal story, a personal miracle that I think sometimes when we have a miracle, we don't take the time to appreciate how blessed we are. We don't take the time to recognize the goodness of Hashem. And I wanted to do so in honor of my son, my son who was bar mitzvah this week, turned 13. Uh, what a beautiful child. What an amazing boy uh, who has now who is now becoming a man. And I thought it was important to take a little bit of time in our class where we're all about inspiration, talking about a personal story, a personal miracle that we all experienced in our family. Okay, so what happened was is that Zahava, my wife, uh, went for a regular checkup at the doctor. I think it was week 28 and a half of gestation. And, you know, this is our fifth child at the time. And, you know, the first four, we were overdue on all of them two weeks overdue everything was standard everything was normal everything everything was obviously a miracle but we don't always appreciate and recognize those simple miracles so what happened was is that Saba goes to the doctor and the doctor does an ordinary checkup and the doctor says you know we see something that we're not exactly sure what it is and we are you know if you can come back in tomorrow we're going to do further testing so Indeed, we had it scheduled that she was going to go in the next day for a checkup. That night, she was in excruciating pain, like abnormal pain. And to the point where she like fell to the ground, she's like in such pain. So we quickly called her doctor. The doctor said, immediately go to the hospital. So we go to the emergency room in her hospital, Texas Women's Hospital. And they say, okay. You know, they do all this testing, they do these scans, they say, okay, there's some good news and there's bad news. The good news is that you're in the hospital. The bad news is that you're not getting out of the hospital till this baby is born. And at least from our standards, we had, you know, 13 and a half weeks left because she's always two weeks overdue till 42 weeks. They don't, you know, they don't do, uh, they don't induce. So till two weeks overdue. So. We thought that this was going to be a very, very long ride. And indeed it was, longer than we had anticipated. Um, they did all these tests and all these scans and all of these uh, blood work and this and that, you name it. And they came back and they said, listen, the doctor is going to share with you now the worst case scenario. Because he has to share with you worst case scenario to prepare you for the worst. But it's it could be better than what he's saying. Either way, the doctor comes in, he says, listen, 80% of the children who have this condition is called gastroschisis. I'll just give you a very basic, uh, non-gory explanation of what this is. Basically, the miracle of how a baby is developed in utero is that all of its inner organs are developing, and then the skin closes up on top of it so that it's all contained in what we know as the abdominal cavity or the stomach area and you know that it closes in the skin closes in on top of it but sometimes one out of a million the skin closes on it and part of the internal organs are outside of the of the closed stomach and that's what they were saying is that our baby our Yehuda had this condition and he was telling us there's going to be at least nine months of surgery where they're going to have to open and close and open and close. As the stomach grows, they're able to put in more of the organs that are outside of the body in. And then they close it up again and then open and then close and open and close for about nine months to a year. And we're like thinking, oh, my goodness. And the second he leaves the room, we quickly go online and we start checking. And it's like it's it's really it's it's not a great way to you know want to have your baby come into this world with such such terrible uh uh challenges and i remember asking the doctor i said to him this was not our regular doctor 
Our regular doctor was an amazing, amazing Jewish man, Dr. Gottesman. Most of you know him, Dr. Mark Gottesman. What a fabulous man. And this this doctor who was on call at the time, I asked him, I said, you know, we're we're Jewish. We're God trying to be God-fearing Jews. We believe in the power of prayer. I said, is this something that can be repaired in utero? You know, that that, you know, we can have a miracle inside. He says to me, you know, very cynic, cynic, cynically, he says, you can pray to whoever you want to pray to, but these images don't lie. Okay, doctor leaves the room, and we're freaking out, not knowing what to do. Like, what do we do now? Like, what, what's, what's the, what is there to do? So the only thing that there is to do, it, the, the Talmud tells us that even if a sharp sword is on your throat, don't give up. Pray to Hashem. And that's exactly what we did. We didn't give up, and we prayed to Hashem. And we called my family. We called Zahava's family. And we let them know, this is a serious thing. We need all the prayers. Shake up the heavens. And my brother got people together, and they went to the Western Wall every night to say recite the entire Psalms. And there were groups of people having these chats of uh, of uh, saying, saying to Hill and saying Psalms. And in each of our classes, that we had a, a torch all in many different synagogues. I shared the story, and people were all saying that they're going to do a mitzvah, they're going to pray, they're going to talk to Hashem and try to beseech the heavens on this little unborn baby's behalf. And for three and a half weeks, Zahava was in, in, in the hospital uh, in what's known as the Trendelenburg position which is the feet are higher than the head to keep the baby in with gravity. And after three and a half weeks at week 32, 33, the doctors say, okay, we, we feel that the baby's at risk and we're going to have to induce the baby, get the baby out. So Zahava just asked, she says, if possible, I would like to have a natural birth. I don't want to do a C-section. They said, okay, we will allow that. And later later on, they were questioning why they even allowed that. But they said, we will allow that, but we're going to have to do this near the operating room, not as a regular labor and delivery, because if there's any complications, we need to move you into an operating room. And the baby either way is going to have to go into an operating room for its own uh, first initial set of surgeries. So we're all prepared for this as much as possible, humanly possible. And there's about, I don't, I don't know, to me it looked like there were 50 people in the room at delivery. Different teams, there's the regular labor teams, there's the, uh, the C-section team, there is the baby's surger, sur- surgical team, and the doctor is giving all the instruction. He's saying, okay, as soon as the baby's out and the, cut, and the cord is cut, we're going to wrap the baby in this towel. Children's operating team, you go to the operating room. Okay? You guys are on standby here if the mother needs an emergency C-section. And then he turns to me and he says to me, you don't move. You stay right beside your wife and don't go anywhere. You don't go with the baby. You don't go anywhere. There's a lot of commotion going on. Okay? All the teams are ready. Everyone's briefed. Thank God baby's born. It's a beautiful baby boy. And baby cord, cord is cut. Baby's wrapped in a towel and rushed off to the to the operating room. The surgeon, two minutes later, comes back to the room and calls me out from the room. And I'm, I'm like shaking because this is not what you want. Two minutes after they rush the baby out, they're calling me out. And I said, what's the matter? She says, absolutely nothing is the matter. She says, please come with me to the operating room. I walk into the operating room, and the baby's lying there on the table. And she says, find it. I look at this beautiful little baby, and I can't find anything. Looks like a regular, normal, healthy baby. And she says, this is a miracle, because these are the images. These are the images. The images don't lie. This is what the baby had. As recently as a few days earlier, 
or even a day earlier, they took these images and it's not there. She says, you can have your baby. So I wrap the baby up and I bring the baby back into the labor and delivery room. And the doctor's like, what in the world is going on here? I said, they said the baby has nothing. He says, that's impossible. We saw it in the images. So I hand the baby over to the doctor and he's like, uh, we're, we're going to have to find this soon. And he gives the baby to Zahava and Zahava's holding her beautiful baby for the first time. And it was still a long recovery because anytime a baby is born before 20, 36 weeks, so it's an amazing thing in the development of a, of a little baby of it, of it in utero. So there are different things they learn at different times. And at 36 weeks, it learns to breathe on its own. But when a baby is born before 36 weeks, it doesn't remember yet to breathe. Our brain sends a signal to our heart to pump and to our lungs to take in oxygen, to release the carbon monoxide that we have from our deoxygenated blood that comes back into our lungs. And when that's what we breathe in, we breathe out, we inhale, we exhale. But the baby doesn't learn to do that till 36 weeks. And because the baby was born earlier, the, the brain didn't get into that rhythm yet. So the baby was in the NICU and the, the neonatal intensive care unit for about three, four weeks. And I remember when we came there the first time with the children, so only there was these loud alarms. And we were like terrified. It sounds like an air raid for her for a missile coming from Gaza. It's like a really loud siren. So, And the, the nurses rush over to our little baby and they shake the baby a little bit to just move the baby around. And the baby was like, oh, oh yeah, I forgot to breathe. And they had this monitor on the baby. And even when Yehuda came home for several months, he still was on a monitor at the house, which would wake up our entire neighborhood almost to how loud it was. Because if any time he forgot to breathe, the siren would sound and we would have to manipulate the child to remember, oh, yeah, 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 I have to breathe. Unbelievable, unbelievable miracles. And as we were there looking at our child, my wife and I immediately remembered the verse in the Torah where Leah gives her fourth son the name Yehuda, because we know that Jacob had four wives, and ultimately each one of those wives was supposed to have three of the 12 tribes, but she got more than her share. She got a fourth. And she says, Hapam ode et Hashem. This time I got more than my share, I got more than I deserved. And we immediately looked at each other and we said, Yehuda, that's his name. We're going to give him the name which gives thanks that every day we remember to be thankful for the gift that Hashem has given us. Every time I hear from people that their wife had a child or their daughter had a child or their niece had a child, and of course I ask, how's the mother, how's the baby? They say, oh, mother and baby are fine. I'm like, don't take it lightly. You have no idea what a miracle this is. It's not a simple thing for a healthy baby to be born and a healthy mother to give birth. It's not a simple thing. And I cannot be more grateful to Hashem for giving us Yehuda. Um, we also named him Noach, Yehuda Noach, because he was born right about the time of these portions. Noach was a big tzaddik. And additionally, Zahava's grandfather, her pater maternal grandfather, was Avraham, Noach Avraham. My father's name was Avraham, so we couldn't name him Avraham. But uh, it was we named him Yehuda Noach. And uh, it's an, an, an incredible honor and a privilege to have a child who the doctor said is going to have asthma his whole life. He's going to have breathing problems his whole life. He's the strongest, most beautiful kid, doesn't have asthma problems, doesn't have breathing problems, thank God, uh, has a very powerful voice, has a very powerful passion 
for accomplishments and doing things and getting things done and the bright boy, just an incredible gift from Hashem. So I think that the reason why it's so important for me to share the story with you, not only because now this week was his bar mitzvah, but also because it's important for us to give thanks to Hashem. Every single day, we start our day with mode ani lefanecha. Thank you, Hashem. I'm thankful to you, Hashem, for giving me life, for giving me the opportunity to take another breath of fresh air, for giving me eyesight to be able to see the sunrise, the sunset, to see beautiful trees, the grass, the mountains, the valleys, the snow-capped mountains, to go to beautiful places, to give me the ability to smell delicious aromas, delicious scents, to be able to hear beautiful music, to taste delicious food, and to sing and to talk and to laugh. We have to appreciate every one of the gifts that Hashem gives us and say thank you, Hashem, endlessly, to never stop thanking Hashem every minute of the day. Because Hashem does what He does to communicate with us. Hashem sometimes gives us really challenging experiences that don't always have a happy ending like this to wake us up. And when they do have a happy ending, they're to wake us up as well. Hashem wants us close to Him. He sends us these messages so that we can learn and grow from them. And to never stop saying thank you. Where the next holiday that we are going to have is in a month from now, the holiday of Hanukkah. Hanukkah is a time where we give thanks. Lehodos ulahalo. It's a holiday that's dedicated to giving thanks. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. The whole holiday. Because Hashem didn't need to save us. He didn't need to give us all the goodness. But He did it anyway because He loves us. And He wants that relationship with us. So here I want to declare publicly to all of you here in the room at the Torch Center, for all of you online who are here on Zoom, those of you who are watching on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and all the other platforms, and all of you who will hear this in the podcast. Let's never stop thanking Hashem. If you're able to move a finger, it's thanks to Hashem. If you're able to walk, it's thank to, thanks to Hashem. Let's never stop thanking Hashem because every movement that we make, every experience that we have is a miracle. Hashem should bless us all, that we should all merit to feel recognize and appreciate each and every miracle that Hashem bestows upon us every single day of our lives. Thank you so much for listening.